risks and just that immediate feeling that I'm not a free citizen anymore. That's what that tells you. I can imagine it must be terrifying in here. Absolutely terrifying for some people. And then the even scarier thing is for those who think that this is part of their normal life, that this is their routine. They'll come in and out of jail, they'll come in and out of handcuffs. There's, there's no way for someone to live. Built to contain our most dangerous criminals and paramilitary prisoners, I've been given unprecedented access to McGabry Prison. Coming in? I come and see us. Question is, when I get back out again? <laughs> and I'm bringing you in with me to meet the men who call it home and find out what leads to a life inside. We're getting treated like criminals in here, Stevie. Every day, a stream of prisoners arrive. Thank you. Thank you. They've done terrible things, hurt many people, caused so much harm. But feeling what it's like to lose my freedom... You wouldn't do too much for those, huh? ..reminds me these people are still human beings. This would be it. Through that door and a lot of years, if that's what your sentence is, to, to think. Most of the men I've met in here have been in for a while. But today, Anita is introducing me to a fairly new arrival, David. And are you? Do I have to have the nudie picture on the wall? There's a nudie man in this place, you know. And when your ma sees it, goes, what the? <laughs> well, she's not going to see them, is she? Well, yes, she will. Why do you have to find your head, though? <laughs> what would his mum think? Yeah, she'd probably think I have taste. <laughs> <laughs> would you be objecting, Anita, if it was you men on the wall? Of course. There's not one of them the same. Long, nope, dark. Definitely not. <laughs> Beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> but you're happy enough? Yeah, yeah. Grant. <laughs> All right, mate. Good to see you. David has previous convictions, including assaulting police officers, but nothing as serious as the manslaughter that recently led to his arrival in McGabry and a stay in Ban House, something he says was a shock to the system. See your first couple of weeks. It is the hardest, like, I was physically starving. And I was on the phone to my family, and I told my sister, um, life is just not what I've living while you're in here, because you're not living. And they came back to me, the staff, believe it or not, because I was being polite and never gave off at them, and they got gave me a job. So they did over in band. So they had heard that phone call and yeah, they, they were concerned about you? Yeah, yeah, so they came to my cell door and gave me a job. I was set up with another guy that was actually here for tying up his cellmate. He tied him up and held him hostage. So he didn't, they put me in a cell with him. And as soon as I went in, he was like, I can't guarantee his safety. And I just turned and looked at the officer like, you need to get me out of here. Like, he's just told you I'm not safe in here. What did the officer say? The officer says, oh, you're gonna have to put your head down. Are you scared in here? Yeah, it is a scary place. You know, I'm not the biggest guy in the world. You know, I'm not. I'm not an aggressive person. I'm not the sort of person that would, like, sort out problems with my fists. Believe it or not, for what I am in here for. David is serving an eight and a half year sentence for manslaughter, after stabbing an intruder in his home. I'm here because of a burglar. I was lying in my bed, and uh, basically didn't drink that night, had a really nice, uh, quiet night, you know. I, I was tempted to go out, but then I was like, no, I'll just have an early night. And then next thing you know, my door got hit. Uh, two masked men, one had a knife. You know, so get... you were in bed at the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the door hit, I go downstairs to answer it, and as soon as I open the door, there was a knife in my face, like, you're dealing in the area, you, you need to give us money, and uh, basically drugs. And uh, I never had any money, but I did have uh, two grams of grass, you know, 20 pounds worth that I smoked myself. I was like, yeah, take what's in the cupboard. And whenever I was standing there, 
like, okay, they're gonna take what they want and like leave me alone. That's whenever he tried to stop me, and it just went into a complete like, unprovoked. Uh, I never did anything at that stage. I was willing to give them. What but they why wanted. would this guy want to stab you? Maybe because they were unhappy with what I had. It's crazy because, see... Really, David, though? Really? Yeah, yeah really. Basically, that's exactly what happened. So in those yeah. moments where he's at the cupboard, you say your back's at the wall, mm -hmm. are you thinking whether to attack him or not? No, no, I had no intention to attack him because I was so petrified, you know? And then whenever he tried to stab me and I got that weapon, then I went into complete attack mode. You're claiming that you tried to protect yourself? Yeah, yeah, basically. And whenever they explained to me what I did in the interview room, I was shocked, you know? What did they say? It says he was stabbed six times, which was, for me, horrible. You know, I was crying my eyes out whenever I heard it because I'd never thought I could do something so barbaric. But it's amazing what you can do when you're in a life and death situation. You know, you might change into someone else for that short time. Where did you stab him? He was stabbed uh, in the liver and heart, which were two fatal wounds. So either one of them would have killed him outright. So you grabbed the actual knife and are you trying to stop it coming into your body or are you trying to... I'm pretty sure what I did is, is I just turned it towards him. The court did not fully accept David's version of events. The judge said that while David was subject to a frightening and unjustifiable assault, the men who came to David's door were unarmed and that it was David who lifted the knife from his own kitchen. What were you convicted of? From day one, I admitted that I killed him. I phoned the police and says, listen, I've just killed a burglar. But what ended up happening is, is it got brought down to manslaughter because I never admitted to, which there was nothing to admit to, that I meant to kill him, which I didn't, you know? It was just in that situation, it was him or me. What did the court find against you then, David? So you have reasonable force, don't you, whenever someone comes into your house? I went beyond that. So what I did, because I saved myself. Morally, it was kind of right, but by the law, it wasn't right. You know, because by the law, you can use so much force, but, you know, I did, the guy, did, like you says, I did kill him. The judge also found that the men had been harassing David in the days leading up to the killing, and that David placed a hammer by the front door and went to bed that night wearing his coat and shoes. So there had been a lead up to this? A lead up, yeah. This wasn't a random Wind burglary? It was windows being smashed, my house being egged. It's just because I didn't know them that well. And then they were trying to like befriend me, but they weren't my sort of people, you know? And then obviously they didn't like that, so they started coming around and smashing my house. What, was the knife never recovered? The knife was recovered, so it was. It was recovered in an alleyway in a bin. Yeah. Because when the other guy ran away, I'm assuming he got rid of it. The judge determined it was David who disposed of the knife. What's it feel like in your quieter moments? You're lying in this bed. It's horrible. Uh, yeah. Why are your eyes tearing up? Uh, just, it is, I guess, an emotional uh, Why? thing. Just because having a death in your hands Whatever scenario, even a war, whatever it is, if you've got a remorse, it's going to haunt you, sort of, you know? It haunts you? Yeah, yeah, it does, definitely. Anyone could have been in my situation. Here, listen, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. it's nice meeting you, Stephen. You too. It is David's view that anyone could find themselves in his situation. But it's how we react that matters. David's actions that night took a young man's life. His parents, his friends, his loved ones have to deal with that reality every single day for the rest of their lives. Prison may be hard, but it's temporary. The trauma, the pain, the grief these men have inflicted on their victims and their loved ones will never go away. Oh, don't get my justice, where is that justice? Where is that justice? Stephen Nolan, you flat prick! <laughs> Can you believe they're calling me fat? Can you believe it? I've just bumped into a prisoner on his way back from visits. He's not happy. 
I had a visit there quarter to three and she's the gate with two kids and says no she's five minutes over the, 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 the attempt you can't have your visit so go back so she's at the front gate there with two kids we're locked like dogs. This is all for you to look through, for you to cameras in. That doesn't happen. Dog, we're locked like dogs over there. Over where? Over in Davis. I'm at Davis. We're, we're all locked like dogs. That's all bullshit because you're in now. This happens. And they get away with everything in here. How long are you in for? Many more years? Two years left. Two. What are you going to do? Go out and come back in? Anyway? No, fuck. Nah, I'm getting the getting, getting the right this time. I'm just going to go back to balance on cars and keep my head down and stand away from cream and have to for this you fucking shit. I'm not, of course, I mean it. I need a change. I'm sick of it. This is a mental health institution. This isn't a deal. This is a change. This is put people's head away. I see fellas coming in here that wouldn't take a drug, wouldn't take nothing, and they end up, before they get out, they're fucking strung out the bed. It's, a, it's not a deal. It's a fucking mental institution. This is. You're only saying, yes, the facilities are brilliant, yes, it looks good, it all looks happy days, but when there's no staff, there's no nothing. Do you get me? And tell me what your latest crime was. My latest, what do you mean, a robbery? But, From five but, years ago, it's just stupid. But you know? robbing who or what? What? Robbing who or what? What was a robbery? Yes, but was it, like, what, what was the robbery? It was a robbery of a post office. I'm not going to go into that, but no one was hurt. I got five years for it, and... All, all I didn't I'm, go in, no, but then... So all, I, so all I'm saying is, right? I, yes, I understand you know exactly what I'm from. saying. Yes, I'm, I'm a saying criminal. there's a... There's no, a no, 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 hold on, hold on. Yeah, there's two people, different things. There's innocent victims, yes. Right, but two different that, things. That, that people do, I know what you're going to try and say. And I understand that people who are doing their job and shouldn't have and to... And you're walking in I somewhere... I understand. And, 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 and traumatising them, yes. and then you're complaining no, about the no, conditions no, no, yeah. and your punishment. But do you think that's right? But yes, I've done wrong, so so there's two wrongs to make it right. But you're repeatedly doing wrong. I understand that, but I'm trying to... To, to, to make you see and, and, and for people to see us as, as what's going on in here. That's what I'm trying to, that's why I don't, I'm talking to you about this, because it's not right. Would it are affect... We, are, people committed suicide. A fellow when I was in Floyd, he died, died. I was down the stairs, see the next two days later, I was fucked in this cell. Do you know what I mean? I was looking out the window and there's the wee black fan that's just there. Tell me this, what can the system do? The system... To hold on, to stop you getting out and coming back in again? System, better facilities, but, but, right? I get out there, I have a, a, my own family to go to, my own address, go to grandmothers, or go to my partners, but they're trying to send people to fucking hostels for base and rapists, hostels with sex offenders, kiddie fiddlers. They're sending people for, he's a criminal, he's a criminal, he's a criminal, right? Or your five year license, right? Go to probation once a week, try and change. What the fuck? Yes, I've come into the crime, but they're, you're going from one jail to another. No, yes, I understand that, but you're going from one jail to another. Do you know what I mean? So you're there, you, you ain't getting out after doing two and a half years. No, you can't go home, you can't go there, but we want to put you in a hostel, the manor, you, there's, legs, or, or, there's lifers are doing only after doing 20 years, there's people are for robbery, there's top fucking Sunday word sex offenders, kitty fillers, the, the worst of disgrace, sitting at the dinner table in them hostels and they expect you, there's no bar to go in and change. I know I've, I've done wrong, but that wouldn't be me. I would rather do the jail and fucking stick the at, you know what I mean? If I had that much money of you sitting on your arse what, torturing them politicians, I would have a few quid. Do you know what I mean? Bye bye, Joe. Do you know what I mean? Listen, see you later. Senior officer, bye bye. See you later. See you later, Stephen. <laughs> see you in the morning. <laughs> The prisoners complain about a lack of resources to help them and their mental health. But the brutal truth is that these are the issues their victims are also dealing with. Any chance of an interview? Are <laughs> oh, you want to interview me? Do you? I'm an innocent man. <laughs> Behind these walls, do these men recognise the damage they've done? 33-year-old Jason was the ringleader of a gang who conned 76 victims out of thousands of pounds in online scams. Well, this is quite hot. Quite dangerous. You might need to stand back. His victims were left feeling hurt, humiliated and angry, with some having lost their life savings. He's agreed to speak to me, but isn't keen to talk about his crimes. I am. You pled guilty to 15 counts of conspiracy. Yeah, that's to, what that's my fraud. Yeah, that's my solicitor advised me to do. Nine of acquiring criminal property yeah. and one charge of converting mm. criminal property. Yeah. What did you do? Well, what? see, that's that's all that stuff was in the past, and I think when I uh, that day when I came from court and I was put in the prison bus, um, I just I, I sort of just move on with the future and I put everything like that behind me. Yeah. So what was the crime? Was it? 
selling people cars, selling people mobiles. At least they thought they were being sold them. Yeah, I believe people bought, I think they bought things that didn't exist at the time. But, you know, the mechanical, the mechanical part of that stuff that was going on, hand on my heart, I have no idea. It's very hard to speak about, it is very, because it's embarrassing. You know, no, nobody wants to talk about mistakes that they've made in their life. So I didn't did do them you do? Mind. Did you con people out of departing with their money? Like, is that what you did? Um, the group of people did, and I was part of that group. You, psychologically, are you in shutdown about what you did? Or is it embarrassment? Because there's no doubt me sitting here, like, you know what you did. But you don't want to say it out loud. It's no, I'm. I, uh, I've, I've been told, and I've, I've, I've heard hundreds of times about what I was <clears throat> part of, and you know, it's, it's, it's confusing for me. Now, I know this may sound stupid to you, but it's confusing to me as it is. Obviously, not as confusing as it is for you, but. Like I say, like, I could mention something that I was probably part of, but it was someone else that was bigger into it. Some victims lost their life savings for imaginary cars that didn't exist. They could say, right, oh, I've lost my life savings and lost this and that. Nobody is going to give their life savings for a car. But, but, but some people lost thousands of pounds. Which is a lot of money. A lot of money to lose for anybody to lose. And, like, were they vulnerable and old and confused? Or well, I, who I was targeted? I wouldn't know about their age, sex and location, to be honest with you. you know, I wouldn't really know much about that. Like, what I'm reading here, and I'm trying to get it from you, Yeah. Jason Donoghue was the ringleader yeah. of a fraud racket worth £187,000 selling mobiles and classic cars that didn't exist. £187,000. Do I look like you, like a man that has £187,000? Well, I don't know, so you tell me. I'm not saying that I wasn't part of something like this, Sarah, because I'm here, I'm in jail. You know, I'm, I'm not delusional, but... I think a lot of other people got off quite lightly with that. But that's, you know, the case is over when it's but dealt in with. what? What was being sold that doesn't exist? Like it says, there was cars there on the paper that you read out, cars and stuff like that there. How did you manage to convince people to buy cars you see, I that didn't, you couldn't no, show see, them? See, this is the thing. I didn't convince anybody. So what did you do? <laughs> you know, I didn't convince anybody to do anything that they didn't want to do. Like, I didn't ask people. I didn't say, look, give me your money, or I didn't go to people and grab them and say, look, I want your money. I didn't rob anybody. Like They thought they were buying a car. Yeah. They gave you their details. Mm and there was never a car. Once you got their bank details, you took their money and you disappeared, and they then couldn't track you down. Yeah. Is that what happened? Uh, that's probably, yeah, that's, that's probably around, around the situation of it, but... Did you know what was happening? Well, to a certain extent, yeah. Like in, in, like in reality, like, yeah. And, and why then, because you'd never been inside before? Never. So why, when you know that, yeah. and you know that there's decent people and they're losing their money, yeah. what, where is the morality inside you? What goes on? Were you desperate for money? Or, like, why didn't you say, hold on, stop? Mm -hmm. I'm hurting people here. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to like, bring this interview into. Well, see, there's a, a lot. See, you could, you, could, you could dwell on that and you could say to yourself, why I did this in my life and why I did that in my life. Nobody really knows the answer to that. Like, we all understand the difference between right and wrong. A lot of people don't. And you didn't? That's... There's a lot of things I don't understand. An awful lot of things. You know, 15 months. That's what you've got to go? It's a long time. A year and three months. 
or 450 days. Whatever way you want to look at it. It's a long time, man. But I don't sit and dwell about it. I don't sit and think about it, really. I try not to, because you sit and think about it, you'll think of stupid things, and you'll open up other things, and you'll think about other worse things, and you think about the past, and that's, that's, that's sort of a place where I don't want to go to, is the past, you know? The judge described you as a calculating individual, a con man, and a liar. <clears throat> See, do you know... Who successfully hoodwinked your victims out of tens of thousands of pounds, and that's from a judge. Yeah. So, obviously, I'm sitting here thinking, <clears throat> Am I being manipulated by someone saying, well, you know, I'm not... <clears throat> oh, you tell me, and I'm sitting here thinking, am I sitting opposite a con man <clears throat> who's shaping around the story? Since I got on that prison bus, I'm a different man. My, my uh, one night was enough here. That the first night I came here, um, I promised myself I'd never come back again. Yes. Uh, if you were to hand me a million pounds, which I, I know you do have, if you were to have me that to stay here for five years, you know, I, I, I wouldn't do it. It's, it, it. It doesn't pay, you know. Money is... Money is... Money is it's immaterial. Money is not immaterial to the people Jason defrauded. Prisoners move on. They work on themselves. They turn their lives around. But their actions have lasting, permanent consequences. Their victims are forced to pick up the pieces. And in the most tragic cases, some don't ever get that chance. Before I leave, I want to speak to the first prisoner I met in here, Andreas. Good to see you. Big honor to meet you, actually. He was sentenced for murder after dragging his victim into an alleyway and beating him to death. I regret what they've done, it and I never can forgive myself. Never. What happened? Just a man was attacked for no reason. Drink. Me and my friend go walking home and attack man for no reason. I see him, his face, everything. You may or may not believe that Andres is remorseful, that he's changed. But there's one more part to his story that he neglected to include. I know a lot more now than what it did in day one that I walked in here. It is such a learning experience, and hopefully it has been for you too. I just want to complete Andres' story, and I think that it's unfinished because there are unanswered questions. So I want to go and have a wee chat with him about some things that I haven't been told and see what his explanation is. Andres! Ah, oh, hello, Stephen. Welcome back. Welcome Good to back. see you. Yes. So, Andres, the reason why I've come back to see yeah. you, when I went outside, yeah. I looked through the court case. Yeah. You had said to me that you don't know why you picked on the person yeah. who you killed. Yeah. But the court said that you specifically targeted that person because they were gay. No. Definitely not, still. I'm just comparing what the court said. Yeah. To So I, I want to read this to you, because at the moment, Andres, what I can't yeah. do is I can't just take oh, what you have said. Oh, I have to put the full oh, version. Sorry. OK? So the judge said, I have no doubt whatever that they did so. This is attack this victim because they knew he was homosexual and intended to attack him and did attack him for that reason. No, it's no true. Definitely no true still. And what the court also saw, Andres, was that after this man was attacked, he was then dragged up an entry and attacked for a second time. By you. I know one remembers this one, so it's very hard to remember. And that this victim was quite well known to be gay, and that you targeted him just because of his sexuality. No, it's no true. Now you've promised me that you're yeah. a reformed person. Yeah. Part of being reformed is about telling the truth. Yeah. All these years later. Biggest mistake in my life. And again, I want to show the victim's family all my heart, Stephen. Why is it hurting so much? Because it took somebody's life. Somebody's life took somebody's life, and that's why no one remember. Lying in the cell sometimes at night time, thinking, why, why this night was, why, why no come back home, why? 
He's the most innocent man. Innocent man. I said, sorry, so no one told me. OK. Truth has been hard to find in Magabri. It's a messy, complicated place. As you've driven into Magabri, you've seen large grey walls, large fences, and those grey walls predominantly keep prisoners in prison, but also keep the general public from actually seeing what happens in prison. It's not the draconian, dark dungeon that people would think. You know, there's a significant amount of good work that goes on in here. Hi. This morning, there's 100 men in my care who have diagnosed and recognised psychotic condition. This is a place of punishment, but locked in here are problems that scare me. Addiction, childhood trauma, huge mental health issues, all complicated and difficult to fix. The scale of that is something the prison service is struggling to address. But although many have been scarred by these men's crimes, we all need to decide how we treat these human beings. Get that floor brushed. I wouldn't like to be paying you by the hour. Oh, I don't get paid for us either. That's an awning, slave labor. <laughs> so, so you think you can tell heaven from heaven. Can you tell a green field from a cold steel rail? A smile from a veil? Do you think you can tell? Did they get you to train? You're here. 